been bestowed upon us, even getting here this morning. We thank you for the rainfall, even though it might have caught some of us off guard. We know that the ground needs it. We know it, it is a distraction sometimes and an inconvenience to us, Father, but we know through your timing, through your love, we know that it will help replenish the nutrients in the ground. Father, I pray this morning that you will, you will listen to us as we worship you, as we worship in song, as we worship in testimony, as we worship with Brother Ben later, as we worship in laughter. Everything we do, Father, we pray that your spirit will descend upon us. Let us feel you this morning. Let us be enriched and empowered, ready to leave here, run out the gates at noon and charge out into this world for another few days, another week until we return again. May we be empowered and, and bold for you. Lord Jesus. In your holy and great name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I have to share something with you. This is what you call a true professional. Uh, Gail is stepping in for Ben Smith this morning. Ben Smith texted me about, what, 10, 15 minutes ago saying that his car wouldn't start and that he'd be behind and uh, that he, he might try to make it. So he might show up in the middle of the service. Who knows? But um, a true professional is this lady right here that will step in in a moment's notice and play for us. So, Gail, how long have you played the piano? Like I said, a true professional. So we're going to worship this morning. And no, oh, no, no. It's all praise to the Lord. Amen. I don't care if we miss a note. Would you stand with me and sing? This is Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me And I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin and won the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me I heard about a mansion He is built for me in glory And I heard about the streets of gold Beyond the crystal sea About the angel singing And the old redemption story And some dream day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Amen. You may be seated. Al, come on back. <coughs> Amen. Victory in Jesus. Always. Forever. Never ending. That's really cool. So if you are a visitor today for the very first time, in the back of the chair in front of you, you're going to find one of these cards. Or if you're a visitor for the second time and you didn't fill one out the last time you were here, please fill one out and so we can have a record of your attendance. And we'll contact you and we'll just try to see if we can't convince you to make this your church home. Um, we have a memory verse we say as well because we, we know that our attitude gives us altitude. The scriptures tell us that. Today is going to be a good day in the Southwest because... And that's found in Psalms 118, 24, and I've almost memorized where it's at. 
It's only been five years, so I'll get it eventually. Today's lesson, our Sunday school lesson this morning was talking about uh, Jehoshaphat. He was the son of Asa. We've been talking about Asa for the entire uh, month about how Asa was just this incredible individual that for the first 36 years of his reign as a king, he followed God and he never had a conflict that he couldn't handle. He only had one conflict in the scriptures. This morning's lesson was about Jehoshaphat. And it, the, the story is the influences that we make on people. It's more than just our wife and it's more than just the people sitting here in this church. Uh, the, the witness and the influence we have can be far-reaching. The people that we meet at Walmart or that we work with or we're driving down the highway and we're waving at them when they cut us off. Well, we want to, we, hopefully we're just saying, hi, have a nice day. But it's our witness that we have to be careful about. I was, I think a lot of people don't realize that the pain from something that affects a lot of us frequently is something we deal with. Pain from physical illness often carries emotional or spiritual baggage as well. It's not just my arm hurts, but sometimes our arms can hurt so much that it keeps us from coming to church. Or it, mentally it gets us down if it's such a prolonged thing like a chronic illness. Well, let's look at a story of healing in John chapter 9. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. You guys know the story. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Back then, um, the, the, the society believed that the sins of the parent would show up in the sins of the child, and most often by blindness. So Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. It happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So when he had said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva he touched it on the eyes of the fella, said, go wash in yonder pond. The fella didn't doubt, didn't delay, didn't try to make plans on how to get there through Uber or anything. He just took off and went straight away. And what happened? He, was, he had his sight back. And we know the rest of the story. He was, he, uh, one of the versions tell us that he was questioned because Jesus did this on a Sabbath. Well, the story is that this, all Jesus had to do to heal somebody is speak a word. But in this story, he, he did it by spitting, because spitting back then was a way that was a common way to make people understand that you didn't think very much of them. You spit on them and you cursed them. Well, Jesus used that very same evidence to show that he could heal. And then remember the old covenant, people who used to serve false gods were cursed by their children. So Jesus took care of that as well. Um, Jesus healed by spitting. He used the very thing that the world used to curse the man his whole life. He did it as an emotional and spiritual restoration. So Jesus didn't just heal the man physically. He did it tridimensionally. He healed him spiritually, mentally, and physically. And that's what we pray for when we do our, our, our prayer time a little bit later. But that's what we do also through our prayers each and every day when we come to God, when we're talking about ourselves, when we're praying for other people. We're not just praying for their, or we shouldn't just be praying for their physical healing. We should be praying for their mental power, for their spiritual strength as well. I just wanted to leave that, share that with you guys. So we are going to take a couple of minutes to meet and greet, but I want to say that we have a special guest with us, Airman First Class Judith Nakoja. Would you please stand? She's uh, somebody that we've all been praying for. She made it through basic training. She's here visiting for the weekend. And so you guys make sure you all tell her that you've been praying for her and welcome. Let's meet each other. Let's greet.
has made, that the Lord has made, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Six, you got it. Let's sing together. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that calms my fears, blessed be the name of the Lord. His music in the sinner's ears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 4. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. There we go. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising up, and I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Sing Jesus. 
Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Ready for Amazing Grace, Gail? Key, key. It's in the key of G. Okay. Oh, I love it. Here we go. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many. Many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace. has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures, when we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We. God's praise then when we first become Amen Love. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through 
through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you father the orphan you father the orphan your kindness makes us whole you shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own you're making me like you clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes for you will have your bride free of all her guilt and rid of all her shame and known by her true name and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips sing you will be praised And you will be praised, you will be praised. Angels and saints, we sing glory, are you Lord? And you will be praised, and you will be praised. With angels and saints, we sing worthy, are you Lord? And you will be praised, you will be praised. With angels and saints we sing worthy, are you Lord? And you will be praised, you will be praised. With angels and saints we sing worthy, are you Lord? And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips sing you will be praised and you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord and you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord and you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord and you will be praised and you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord. father god you are worthy of our praise this morning and i thank you so much that we can raise praise to you father god 
And I thank you for Gail and her ability to come in and raise praise to you. Father, with no advance notice, you guided her fingers this morning to play, and you've blessed her with that talent that you've given her. And I thank you for her service, Father God. And I thank you for every single person that's here this morning, Father, that, that cares enough about you to come and assemble as believers as you've called us to do. Father God, it's, it's not enough just to stay at home. We, you call us to come together as a church and to serve. Father, I pray, as, as we heard this morning, the great things that are happen, happening in, in Wild and Wonderful Wednesdays, Father God, I just pray that you would continue to touch those hearts of those children, Father God, that they would know you, that they would know your peace, that they would know your grace, Father God, and that if they are at all troubled in anything, Father God, if their needs are not met at home, Father, that, that you would meet their spiritual need, Father, and that you would make sure that they're taken care of. You, you love us so much, Father God, and you show that to us each and every day, and I just pray for their future. Father, that they would choose to serve you if they haven't made that decision. And I thank you today for just the beautiful rain that we saw outside, Father God, the break from the heat. Father, no matter what trial or temptation that we suffer, Father God, if it's a week of 100 degree weather, there's always rain on the horizon somewhere. There's always a colder temperature, Father. You'll never give us more than we can handle. And that's true in life and in the weather, Father. And we thank you for that so much. We ask that you be with Brother Ben this morning, that you would speak through him, words that we need to hear today. We give you praise, and we will ever keep your praise on our lips as we just sang. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Uh, we have a Hi. few prayer requests what we're doing that right we now in our service want to remember. Uh, a time I believe it's Martha Ferguson's and it's uh, daughter, Linda, and get up also and remember pray for people that Farrell have needs. and they can either to come to the front of the church here, or next month. if they um, hold up their hands, we gather around them also, and we, we pray for them. Uh, and so we want to include you uh, in this Debbie, part of our service. Yeah. That means yeah, if you was, have a need today, uh, you can uh, just make a comment on the screen, of, uh, and we're going to have someone that looks at that. We're going to be praying kidneys, for you. Okay? We have so a weekly prayer time at our church, and we're going to pray for you. If you don't want to just put out all the details of your prayer requests, what you can do is just go set. Go ahead and yeah, say we're going to we're going to take a few moments and, and, then and pray right now. Later on, um, you, you can you can buddy up with a, a, a couple a there on your on your and, row uh, there, or the altar is up know, front if you'd like to come forward and pray. Contact information and uh, after time of prayer, I will speaking. lead us in our offertory and you prayer. Can get a hold Let's of us pray and, and kind of uh, inform us uh, in more detail. But the main thing is we want to pray for you because I know the power of prayer. And I tell a lot of people, the power of prayer, it reverses the curse. Because we live in a fallen world, and this world is, is messed up. And we see all these problems around us. But prayer is part of the answer to the solution. All right? And so what I want to do right now, if you have a need in your life, and I'm sure you do, we all do. Sometimes it's a major need, sometimes it's a minor need. But I just want to pray for you right now. And I hope you allow me to do that. So let me lift you up in prayer right now. Uh, before we get back to our service, okay? Father God, I just pray for these viewers that are watching right now. God, I don't know what they're going through, but you know exactly what they're going through. You know every hair on their head. It's, the Bible says they're numbered. So I just pray for this brother or sister, Lord, that you're going to minister to them, that you're going to meet their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Hold them up, Lord. Give them support. Give them strength and minister to them, Lord, and let you know that you will never leave them nor forsake them. And Lord, you said in your word, if you be for us, who can be against us? That's what your word says. So I pray, Lord, that you would help these viewers that are watching. Lead them. Give them wisdom and understanding and put a wall of defense around them. Protect them from the evil one. And I pray this in Jesus Christ, holy name. Amen. All right. Listen, God knows all about what you're going through. And I pray and I know that he is going gonna, is gonna to minister to you. Okay. Just turn your eyes upon Jesus, and He's going to minister to you. Now, again, contact us. Let us know about if, you know, if your prayer needs are, have been met, or if you have a praise report. We like to hear about those also, all right? Uh, every now and then, we have just a time in our service where people get up and say, man, I had this tremendous need, and God came through. And, you know, it encourages all of us just to keep on praying, because the Bible says pray without ceasing. So God bless you. We're going to go back now to our worship service.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning thanking you for another day. Father, thank you that we can come here to to worship, to learn, to lift up. And Father, and I just know that you're hearing these prayers of your people, lifting up these that we've mentioned this morning, and we just ask for your will to be done in their lives. Uh, Father, we do we we selfishly pray for healing. If, if that's your will, Father, we, we look forward to the healing of that. And uh, Father, but we, we want your will to be done in these lives. And Father, we just thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, we lift up our tithes and offerings to you right now and just ask for your blessings on it. Help us, Father, as we continue to uh, spread your love and your word to those around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Because I can't even 
Thank you so much, Gary and Sue. And I'm glad you guys got out here uh, on a, it was pretty rainy this morning and stormy. Man, it, it looked kind of bad. And so it was hot, hot, dry, dry, dry. And then all of a sudden now, it is kind of a monsoon season. I think for the forecast for the next eight or nine days is rain. But anyway, our children are being dismissed to Children's Church. If we have some going, I don't know. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'm glad you're here. And you know what's kind of cool about Two Lakes is I think we are a transgenerational church. And by that, I mean you go to some churches and it's all young people. And you go to some churches and it's all kind of old people. But we have senior citizens. We have mothers with young babies here. And I think that's cool. That's really cool. That's what a church really should be. Uh, we should have all generations and represented with our church. Well, this morning we're continuing on our series of uh, parables. This is the second parable. The parable last week was the wedding feast. And so um, a parable, as you know, would be an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. And Jesus used it so that those that didn't really want to know the truth couldn't probably get it, figure it out. But those that did they would dig deeper and find out and understand what he was saying. Now, this is about putting things off, all right? Uh, not being ready, and we should be ready. Let me share a story with you, Will. It's a little joke, actually. Maybe you'll laugh. I don't know. Um, there was this man and a woman up in their attic, and they were going through stuff. You know, we all have attics and stuff we need to clean out. Amen? All right? And... Uh, he came and he said, look at this. This is a claim ticket from the local shoe repair store, shop down there. The local shoe repair shop. He said, I can't believe that's what happened to those shoes. Yeah. He asked his wife. He, uh, he, he looked at the date and it was stamped 11 years earlier. It had been there for 11 years. And he said to his wife, do you think those shoes could possibly still be down there at that local shoe repair shop? She said, I doubt it, but it's worth a try. So the guy takes the claim ticket, 11-year-old claim ticket. He goes down to the shop with a straight face. He hands it to that guy. He looks at it, looks at him, says, it's going to take a few minutes. He goes back, brings out a pair of shoes. He said, yeah, I got them. Guy says, I can't believe it. They've been here after all, all these years. And the guy said, yeah. And he said, they'll be ready next Thursday. <laughs> he was even the greater procrastinator. Listen, the, the simple message of this parable we're getting ready to read is to be, be ready to meet the Lord. Be ready to meet the Lord and do not procrastinate. Do not delay. It is the most important thing that we can ever do our, with our lives is to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And you know, I was reading quite a few commentaries looking at this, and, and a lot of people have given a lot of strange meanings to this, this parable, you know, about uh, the attitude of the church down through the ages of Jesus coming, or do you have light of influence, or you, do you not have the light of influence? And some people even use it as well they lost their, the oil, their lamps went out, or their torches went out. I'm going to share that with you in just a little bit, and that you could lose your salvation. Some strange kind of interpretations, but we're going to read it, and we're going to break it down, and this is what I think it clearly means. Remember, a parable, usually Jesus gave it to illustrate one or two main points, okay? And then afterwards, I'm going to explain what a Jewish wedding. It's going to make more sense after I explain it. But let's go ahead and read our text, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened, of course, this is Jesus speaking, shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps, and I'm going to show you that word should be translated torches, and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. 
But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, he, he waited a long time, didn't he? A cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps or our torches are going out. But the wise answer saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Let's pray. Father God, we ask for your blessing on this message, upon the reading of your word, upon each person that's here today. Lord, we pray that you would meet them where they are. And Lord, I know some need encouragement, Lord, today, and they've been going through a lot of problems, Lord. Help them, Lord. Just speak to their hearts. Give them your grace and mercy and lift them up today. And Lord, we pray uh, that your will would be done in this service, Lord, and that if there's anyone that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, they would do that this morning if they're watching uh, on social media or wherever, Lord, so that they would be ready for that day of your return. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for this to make sense, what you have to know is how a Jewish wedding, and it still happens this way today, how, how it all comes down. In a Jewish wedding, there were basically three parts, three stages of the wedding, or of the marriage, let's say, of the marriage. The first part was a contract, basically, the engagement contract between the fathers of the bride and the groom. And usually... The bride and the groom had little influence on that. It was a contract. And then there was the second stage, which was a betrothal. And a betrothal is where they came together. That's where Mary and Joseph were, okay? They actually exchange vows to one another, and they, they say vows. And the betrothal period lasts um, between anywhere from uh, four or five, six months to a year, and during that time, the groom is getting his house together. The groom is getting, you know, make sure he has a, a job, he's employed, he's working on his farm or whatever so he can support his wife. And uh, by the way, if he dies during the betrothal period, the groom dies, she's considered a widow. Okay? So it's very binding. A betrothal was very binding. And then the last stage is where this parable starts is the wedding ceremony kind of and wedding feast. It's more of a celebration and a wedding feast. And it doesn't last just a day. It lasts an entire week. In fact, uh, it, it goes on for an entire week. Now, how they get together is this. The groom and his groomsmen, they don't tell the bride when he, he's coming. But they usually kind of get an idea. They should have an idea or his mother-in-law will not be very happy, okay? So we figured that in this parable that the mother-in-law has an idea, uh, the mother of the bride, and she tells them to get ready. The bridesmaids stay with the, the bride because he can come at any time unexpectedly, okay? Uh, you never know. It could be within a day or two. Uh, you're not sure. And so they, you have to be ready. When he comes to the bride's house, all of a sudden, the bridesmaids get up. It usually happens at night. They light their torches, and they march through the street, and everyone in the village usually joins them. There's a Jewish saying that says everyone from 6 to 60 joins and follows, or follows the marriage drum. And so what it would be is they come and go, surprise, okay? He is required, he is required to send a man ahead of him saying, the groom is coming, the groom is coming. So he is required, okay? It's custom that he says that. And so there's several uh, rules. No one, it says, can be in the procession unless they have a lighted torch, Okay? That, that happened, uh, a guide was telling a guy that was visiting Galilee not that long ago. That is the custom. You have to have a torch that's lit, and once the door is shut, late guests are not accepted. 
And that's, that, that happened just not that long ago. And so that is still a custom. And so it's kind of hard on the bride and her bridesmaids and the family, right? Because when is he going to show up? And so he's delayed. He comes at midnight. All right. So all of a sudden they say the groom is coming. They've fallen asleep. Now, the word lamp, I think, is uh, not translated because correctly, it is lampus in the Greek. But what it means. Uh, that's the same word when they arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says the guards and the soldiers came carrying lampus, which were, was torches. They carried torches. When you look at another word, like don't hide your, uh, don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel, that word used for really a lamp, a household lamp, is luknos, luknos. Okay, so I think it makes more sense. It makes a lot more sense to me when I realize that this is talking about torches. So scene one, the parable opens with ten bridesmaids preparing for an evening wedding procession. The bridesmaids are to light their torches and join the procession when the groom arrives at the bride's home to take her back to his house for the joyous ceremony and wedding feast. However, the groom is delayed and they all fall asleep. The meaning here is this. You've already figured it out. The meaning, the ten bridesmaids or virgins, most of the bridesmaids were chaste young women that were unmarried, represent professing Christians who outwardly appear ready for the Lord's second coming, and the groom represents Christ. Those are, that's what it represents. The, the bridesmaids represent Christians who outwardly seem to be ready for the Lord's second coming, and the groom represents Christ. We know that in you can't go by outward appearances, though. We know in Matthew 23, 27 through 8, Jesus gets on the Pharisees, and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside you are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So there are some people today that are maybe professing Christians, but they are not born-again Christians. They're not born-again Christians. I do think in the Baptist church that we uh, specifically ask people to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I think that we are better off because we challenge each person. Do you have that? Do you have that relationship? Some churches, I don't think, push that enough. They don't stress that enough. And it's kind of more of, of bells and whistles and all that sort of thing. So uh, I think there will be some people that are very surprised. Jesus thought that, obviously, or he wouldn't be uh, telling the story that they think they're ready, but they're not ready again. They don't have a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go to the other scripture, but it says that they have a form of godliness, okay, but they deny the power thereof. And the power is the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. It is the power of God. The Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So that is the power. And the gospel says that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and he is the Savior of the world alone. Amen. No one comes to the Father, Jesus said, except by me. If you have a, a different gospel or different whatever, that's not of the Lord. Number two. Scene two, scene two. Suddenly, the bridesmaids are awakened by a cry announcing the groom's approach. The five wise virgins, what they do, they have their flask. If you'll notice in the Bible, it says that, that the foolish virgins, it says that they took no oil with their lamps. Uh, it says the, the, the virgins arose and, and trimmed their lamps, and it says that, um, there we are, it says... Uh, and at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming to go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And that word trimmed actually doesn't mean trimmed. It means ordered or arranged. And so what they did is they took the flask of oil. It said the others did not take any oil with their torches. They saturated it, and then they lit it. The foolish, they said, Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. What they did is they lit just the cloth. The cloth that was supposed to be saturated with oil, but you know that burning cloth burns up very quickly. And so they lit it, and their, their torches went out. And the wise answers say, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to buy those who sell and buy for yourselves. Listen, there's some things that you can borrow, but you can't borrow salvation from somebody else. 
You can't borrow salvation from somebody else. You cannot be- borrow like character from somebody else. And so you can't buy salvation either, but the, the, the point is here that you are to go to God because he alone is the one that gives us salvation. It is our relationship with him when he comes into our hearts, when he comes to, into our lives, then we are saved. And so uh, we know that the Lord will appear. And, and by the way, this had special significance. We'll have special significance to those during the tribulation. Okay? But at the same time, maybe not all of our charts are absolutely right. I think we need to be ready to meet the Lord at any time because, listen... Even it brings it to a real point today, makes it very applicable to us today, because when you die, that's your judgment day, or at least the initial judgment day for each one of us. The just will go to heaven, and then our final judgment will be when we stand before the Bama seat of Christ. The unjust, the wicked, will go to a place called hell, and then at the great white throne, they'll be completely judged, and that will be the final judgment. So... The Bible says that we need to be ready because we don't know. We don't know that day or hour that we will leave this world or that Jesus Christ is coming back. In Matthew 24, 29 through 31, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hallelujah. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. All right, we talk about Gideon's trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And that will be all the saved and all of the the redeemed. The secret is of being born again. I don't know if I got to the meaning of that. I've already kind of appeared, but uh, kind of said it. But when the Lord appears at the second coming, many professing Christians will realize only too late they are lost, having never been born again and regenerated by the oil of the Holy Spirit. The way that we know we are saved and born again is because we have the Spirit within us. We are born again of the Spirit. Jesus stressed that to Nicodemus in John 3, 3 through 7. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and I believe that's natural birth. You know, before a child is born, her water breaks, a woman's mother's water breaks, and uh, the amniotic fluid. And so uh, it says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, I think he explains the above. Uh, is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The Bible says that when we ask Christ into our lives to be our Lord and Savior, that there's a miraculous transformation that happens, and we become new creations in Christ. Amen? And we have a witness of the Spirit, a witness of the Spirit. Romans 8, 14 through 16 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba. That's an Aramaic term. It means uh, daddy, daddy, father. The, the, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I'm going to touch on this just a little bit later. So... Uh, we need to know that we are ready. We need to know that we have that witness of the Spirit. Scene three, scene three is this. After the five wise bridemaids join the procession, they light their torches, enter in, into the wedding celebration, the five foolish bridesmaids return after a futile attempt to find oil. I don't think they found any oil. The parable doesn't say they found any oil. It's midnight. All the shops are closed. And try to enter the festivities, but the groom denies them and replies, I do not know you. Assuredly, I do not know you. The meaning here is that there will be no second chance to enter into the joy of the Lord when Christ returns. The pseudo-Christianity of the lost 
will be exposed and their sorrow will be great. I believe in each one of us that we need to be able to see a witness of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And you know, when we are lost, when people are lost, the gospel is really offensive. Nobody likes to be told, you're not with the Lord. You know, nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. And that's why some people, they have to get mad before they can get glad. Amen? They have to realize, I am convicted. I am a sinner. But it doesn't end there. That's why Jesus died on the cross for each person upon this earth, that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? I mean, that's why he did that. That is the good news. Yes, we all fall short of the glory of God. God is absolutely perfectly holy. We we don't really understand that because we compare ourselves with each other. I'm just as good as Joe or Sue or any, you know, other people. But God is absolutely holy. Holy, absolutely no sin, no wrongdoing in his being, his everlasting being. And so when we realize the holiness of God, that's the only way that we can be made right with him is through Jesus. And that's why he went through all that suffering. That's why he left the throne of glory to come down here to be a man so that we could have our sins taken away and his righteousness given to us, imputed to us. You know, Matthew 7, 22 and 23 says that in that day, there will be a lot of people going, Lord, we did all these things for you. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You can do things. You can do church things. But you have to have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. He has to be the Lord of your life. He has to be the Lord of your life. Jude, uh, I'm going to go to Galatians 1, 6 through 9. You can look that other one up on your own time. I marvel, this is what Paul says to the church at Galatia, I marvel that you were turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. There are people today that, there's cults today that don't preach this, this Bible. They preach something else or they've changed it or they've given it some weird interpretations. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you. Let him be, he's not mincing words, accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed, because he said Jesus is the only Savior of the world, and I have had the opportunity to go around the world, and I unapologetically preach to Muslims, I unapologetically preach to Hindus, and to Buddhists, and to animists, and to Shintoists, and whatever you are, and saying God is calling the one true God, the one creator God, is calling all people from all religions to come to his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. That's it. That is the gospel. That is the good news. G-O-S-P-E-L. God's only son provides eternal life. G-O-S-P-E-L. File that away. That is the gospel. God's only son provides eternal life. Period. There's no other plan B. There's no C. There's no D. And so we need to be firm. Now, let me just ask this. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? Paul said we should test ourselves. I know that before test I would have in school and college, I would get with some of my classmates and we would go over the answers. You know, there's 10 things we need to know. He's going to ask us this. You tell me those 10 things. We would test ourselves before we got to the time of the test. Amen? I didn't want to wait till I got in there going, oh, I didn't try to go over these. Uh, let's see, I read them. but We need to test ourselves. Here's kind of a five-point test I'm going to throw out to see if you really are saved. Okay? Number one, do you remember a time and place that you were saved? We had a great concert last night. 
And uh, the five brothers were here. They were brothers, and they had to be like from 60 to, I don't know, 85 or something. But the, the Stanley Jones was one of the eldest or kind of the leader. And he said, I remember when I was 11 years old at that little church where I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember a time and place where that transformation happened? He said, I was standing out on the porch of this little church. I felt so clean. I felt so good. I didn't even want to touch anything. Because I was just on this Jesus high. I had finally given my heart and my life to Jesus Christ because my Sunday school teacher challenged me if I really knew him. Number two, were you saved according to what the scriptures teach? All right. When you read the Bible, do you say, yeah, that's me? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Did you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you tell other people that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Number three, do you have that inner witness of the Holy Spirit? The Spirit himself will bear witness with your spirit. You are a spiritual being, but the Holy Spirit of the living God will... will, will Abide in you, and you will have this inner sense of his abiding presence. You will know that you're not alone. You will know in those times of prayer, I feel the Lord's presence. Am I talking to somebody out there? That sometimes when you get alone, and you get in your bedroom, and you've had a big problem or a bad day, and you get there, you feel that the Lord is there in your heart. You know, you sense him. It's almost like he gives you a hug. You feel this hand on your shoulder. It's the Holy Spirit. Number four, do you relate to Jesus as your Lord? Lord, you know, we just kind of go, yeah, Lord and Savior. Lord in the Greek means kurios. It means boss. It means CEO, the one that you follow. He is your leader. Jesus is not a trinket you put in your pocket. Jesus is not a bobblehead you put on your dash. Jesus is not a little cross that you hang around your neck. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is your Lord. Is he your Lord when you pray to him? Is he your Lord uh, when you fellowship with him? And number five, do other people see Jesus in you? Do other people bear witness of your salvation? Say, man, I, I can see God in you. There's some people, I've, I've come up to them and I say, I know you're a Christian. And they go, yes, I am. I can say, I can just see Jesus all over you. And the way you love, the, the, your kindness, your patience, your, your, your just, your eyes. You know, sometimes you can look at a person's eyes and just see that glow, that inner presence of the Lord. And so those are five things. Do you remember a time and place you were saved? Were you saved according to the scriptures? Do you have that inner witness of the Holy Spirit? Do you relate to Jesus as your Lord, and do others see Jesus in you? The main point of this parable is this. The main point is this. Live in wisdom. Be ready to meet the Lord today. No one knows the day or the hour of his return, nor do you know the day of your death and your departure into eternity. When you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, only then do you possess the oil of his Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says that um, Matthew 24, 36 through 42, that people are going to be preoccupied when Jesus comes back. Or they're going to be just doing other things. A lot of people aren't concerned about their relationship with the Lord or spiritual things. They don't even think about it. The, the devil loves for you not to think about it. Just take it off of your radar. You know, the devil's favorite word is not a cuss word. His favorite word is tomorrow. Just tomorrow. Somebody said, you know, the problem with people that say, I'm going to be saved at the 11th hour, they often die at 1030. It says, but on that, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as, it, as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son, the coming of, the son of Man be. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. 
Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. You don't know. We don't know that day or hour. One will be taken to the Lord in glory. One will be taken away in judgment. Two people will be there. They look the same. Those virgins were probably dressed the same. They all had torches that looked the same. But they were different because five of them, if we cut to the chase, had the oil of regeneration. They were saved. That's the meaning of the parable. And the other, others looked like outwardly they were ready, but they weren't. They weren't ready. They weren't ready. And so this is why, this is the job of the church. This is the job of missions. This is the job of Wild and Wonderful Wednesdays to make sure that each child is ready. You know, I used to work at this, this building called Madison Avenue. And, and no, no, it's uh, uh, the Petroleum Building. This is before we moved there. We had a little office during in oil and gas business. And uh, there was a guy out there that was in a bulldozer, the lot next to us, they were cleaning, they were, they were taking down the trees and cleaning the brush off and all of this sort of stuff. And uh, uh, he was out there working in his dozer when I went to work that morning. And so then at lunch, I, he, he's out there in his bulldozer and, and uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, and all that noise of, of a, a caterpillar going over there. And uh, at after lunch, I come back into the office, and I'm sitting there, and I'm going, man, that, that caterpillar doesn't sound right. It's just kind of going, but it's not moving. It doesn't sound right. I run out there, and this is in Elk City, in Elk City, Oklahoma. I run out there. The guy is slumped over on the seat there. So I get a friend. I run in. I call a friend. He's kind of turning blue. I grab him. We haul this guy down. I start doing mouth-to-mouth on him. They say that's not recommended anymore, just, just heart comp- chest compressions. But anyway, I do everything. I'd had uh, CPR, and uh, we, we work on him. The, the, we call 911. The EMTs come and everything. He's gone. They did everything they could. He's gone. And and I'll never forget that. I mean, I did everything I could. I mean, I never stopped. They didn't get there for like 20 minutes. I never stopped pushing on his chest. I never stopped blowing into his lungs, trying to revive that man. You know, I don't think that when he went to work that day that he thought, this is it. I don't think he thought, I'm not going to come home. I'm going to call my wife. I'll, I'll see you when I get home. Had he known that, he'd probably called his kids and his grandkids, but he didn't have that chance. That was his appointed hour. He went home to be the Lord. And I remember like, I did all I could. I couldn't save his life. They couldn't save his life. My point is, and you get it, it's just, it's just be ready. It's be ready. We don't know. I've been with people that I feel that are ready to meet the Lord. And unexpectedly, they've gone to be with the Lord. You know, I had a friend in seminary, and, and uh, he was an older guy when I was in seminary, and his name was Chet Lackey, and we always joked, and, and so we finished the December uh, fall semester, and then in spring, I came back, and I was like, where's Chet? They said, man, he had an operation and died. I said, really? You know, like, oh, Chet's not going to graduate. <laughs> you know, he's not going to make it. Chet was a good guy, he was, uh, but he was ready. Chet was, a, he was serving the Lord. He was studying to get better, to be a better preacher right up until the time that the Lord said, Chet, you're not going to get that degree, but you're going to graduate. <laughs> Amen? You're not going to get that degree, but you're going to be promoted. So I conclu- uh, uh, conclude the message this morning. Are you ready? Because one day that door will be shut. You need to be ready today for that final, that final time. When you enter eternity or the Lord comes back and you see the Lord coming back with his holy angels, then it will be too late. Do you know him today? Don't say tomorrow. And I don't care if this is the first time you've ever been in this church. If God is dealing with your heart, if the Holy Spirit is dealing with you, you come and receive Christ as your Savior this morning. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, this is your time. This is your holy invitation time. Lord, the parable is very clear that we need to be ready, that there will be a time, a a line drawn in the sand when there will be no second chance to get ready. 
And so, Lord, our time is during the church age while we still have life and breath and all of us are alive right now, but we have no promise of tomorrow. We think we're going to be here. We think we're going to wake up in the morning. We think we're going to have supper tonight, but we do not know that. And that's the point that Jesus was making to his, the people that were there, Lord. We need to be ready right now. And if there's someone here, Lord, I just pray that everyone would search their hearts. And if someone says, you know, I'm just not sure, I pray that they would come up and we'll pray with them. Or someone says, I know I'm not ready. I, 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 God has dealt with me, but I am not ready. I know that. But I need to do it. I am not going to wait till tomorrow because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. That's the word that Jesus uses. Today is the day of salvation. Today, get your hearts right with me. Lord, move in this invitation. Help us, Lord, to not only be ready ourselves, to, but, but, but make sure that our friends and family are ready also. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Would you prayerfully rise if God has spoken to your heart this morning, if he's touched your heart, if you know that you need to make a decision. Jesus called all of his disciples publicly. You come forward. You come forward. Don't be ashamed. Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him Come in. There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Is God speaking to you? You come. Time after time, he has waited before, and now he Another verse. If you need to come, you come. If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him and all of your darkness will end within your heart. everyone bow your head just the piano playing I'm just going to uh, do one last thing here you know somebody may be out there and you're, you're ashamed you're embarrassed to come up front but I'm going to ask you with everyone else you have your heads bowed your eyes closed if you said pastor I want to talk to you after church I want to talk to you about my salvation would you just look at me would you just look at me Wave your hand just a little bit. Nobody's looking around. Just between me and you. Okay? Thank you. All right? I'll tell you, I, I will stay here. I'll stay here at this church until I know that you know that you're a born-again, blessed, heaven-bound child of God. Father, thank you for your love. And I pray, Lord, that we would all understand that this is the most important thing in this world while we're alive upon this planet that we can do. And that's to have a saving relationship with you. Lord, today, if anyone needs to talk to me or someone else in this church, I pray that they would do so. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, tonight we're going to continue our ser uh, series at six o'clock. 
uh, on uh, David Jeremiah, Maya, the Overcoming series. Also, uh, this uh, Friday is going to be the ball game. So uh, I'll have the tickets. Well, probably it'll be Will Call, and I'll have them down there. So if you want to go to the ball game, uh, let me know so I can get those tickets for you because I'm ordering them tomorrow morning. Yes. Anxiety with peace. Okay. All right. All right. God bless you, and we will see you soon. God bless you. Have a great day in Jesus.